In moments of great stress, every life form that exists gives out a tiny subliminal signal. Don't panic, someone said. But when they looked around to discover who had such confidence in the future, that person had already fled. So panic ensued, and everyone started working furiously to bring about the change they so desperately needed by doing exactly the same things that they'd done before. But this time, they said it was different. They worked harder, faster, more efficiently, used the same tools in different shapes and sizes, developed policies, formed international agreements, and shouted in loud, green voices that change was happening. Yet in their panic, all they really achieved was to tread the slow rather than the fast path towards environmental destruction. And in this particular universe, the planet was not threatened with demolition to make way for a hyperspace bypass. And it wasn't the Vogons, or even the mice, the protrusion into Earth's dimension of vastly hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings that caused the panic. Since the future of Earth's supercomputer was threatened by an internal malfunction, it seems that someone had been asking the wrong question. Something to do with the long-term use of complex hydrocarbons had caused the error, which the supercomputer simply could not compute. Yet because it seemed important, the same, kept, uh, same question kept on being asked, and sometimes shouted in many different languages. So the Earth grew despondent and gave up trying to understand what was being asked of it. Instead, it cursed using rather spiteful carbon dioxide language every time the question was repeated. It was exactly at that point when levels of the greenhouse gas had reached Tourette's proportions, which somebody told everybody, don't panic. The Stone Age did not end because humans ran out of stones. It ended because it was time for a rethink about how we live. I'm a multidisciplinary practitioner an ideas hitchhiker, making a journey whose end is not entirely certain and whose course is riddled with chance encounters along the way. My view of complexity is that of an informed amateur, where I will curate concepts and ideas as motel coordinates in this talk, which will shape my hitchhiker's guide to complex systems. So the first stop off we'll take is Paradigm Motel. When human culture adopts new ideas or ways of working, we tend to use old frameworks of thinking to explore them. Iron Bridge was the first metal bridge built by Abraham Darby II, the grandson of the first foundry owner and an ironmaster working at Colebrookdale in Shropshire, England. The bridge was built in 1779 and could be thought of as the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. This was the first construction of its kind, with no precedent, and so it was imagined through the established practice of carpentry. The iron frame was cast into 800 pieces which were joined using bolts and fastenings that were typical of woodworking, such as blind dovetail joints. Only a few years after the bridge was built, cracks appeared in the masonry and cast iron. The bridge still stands today as a heritage site, no longer carrying the weight of traffic it was designed for, but proudly boasting its pioneering battle wounds as bold structural fractures. They give testimony to the extraordinary feat it embodies, which ignited a construction revolution. It was not until nearly a half a century later that the native qualities of steel began to be exploited. By 1818, the Coalport Bridge, designed by William Hayward, used less iron and a leaner design that exploited the native potential of the material properties of iron. So whatever your discipline, the lesson from the civil engineers at the start of the Industrial Revolution is that when you reach for the idea of complexity in your problem-solving tool set of approaches, I would like you to think really, really deeply. Are you using the idea of complexity as a piece of iron as if it were a wood um, a jut in a metal bridge slotted into an old paradigm? Or are you using your piece of iron like steel that embraces new native qualities of a fresh medium to navigate your own discovery space? The choice, obviously, is yours. But it's important to know why you're making your decisions so that you can find your way around a somewhat shockingly unfathomable map of reality. 
This is Method Motel. In the process of constructing my hitchhiker's map, I've taken a particular approach to my research, which consists of three organisational attractors, and I'm going to call these the three Cs. Convergence, which are the combination of approaches. Constructivism, defined by um, Isabel Stengers as an ecology of practices. And confabulation, because it begins with C, and is actually the imaginary role, the creative role, and particularly the use of hypothesis and speculation in dealing with the unknown. So complexity, oh, yeah, com complexity pervades many scientific and non-scientific disciplines. Its conceptual framework promotes collaboration in itself, because we're networking, and enables convergence through shared subject matter. Not only as a platform that enables the meeting of minds, but as a method in combining skills to develop new technologies. The significant economic and human benefits of convergent practices was extolled in an NSF report in 2002 by Rocco and Bainbridge. This report led to funded innovation sandpits, both by the NSF and EPSRC, where multidisciplinary practitioners, predominantly scientists, collaboratively addressed grand challenges such as artificial photosynthesis. The transatlantic collaborations produced some rather strange technologies, such as cyberplasm, a lifelike system forged by synthetic biology, nanotechnology and robotics. I describe it as a kind of chimera. More recently in the UK, there's been enthusiasm for the creative role that arts play in technological innovation, with initiatives such as STEAM, where the arts is uh, considered as being contributory to science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and is aimed to recruit students into these practices, um, and is viewed as a stimulating uh, force for economic growth. But why? Why does a partnership between different disciplines offer such fertile ground for innovation? The juxtaposition of different skills and knowledge sets creates new fusions through horizontal couplings and information through these collaborative practices. They may be regarded as a kind of research conversation, as exemplified in Hans George Gadamer's method, method, who proposed a dialogic approach to the production of knowledge. Gadamer enabled researchers to bring subjective influences into their work to read humanities in a cultural context in which they were uh, critiqued. In other words, using synthetic rather than analytic approaches. This constructivist method of working is consistent with Isabel Stenger's notion of ecology of practices, which counters the homogenizing influence, particularly of science, as she worked with Ilya Prigozhin, and encourages researchers to dream along together. This is going to be the most controversial one. Fiction embodies the intrepid nature of humankind and the kind of risk that is taken when a researcher steps outside of the comfort zone of their field of expertise and moves towards, personally, unknown spaces to open up new areas of inquiry in their research. This brave and bold step in a making a multidisciplinary practice is essential for proposition making and developing hypotheses to open up new spaces and possibilities for exploration. These aren't just things that exist alone. They're reflected on and tested in other ways against established methods and knowledge areas. And this is not a new approach. It is already in widespread contemporary use. Arguably, the whole field of biodesign is using this kind of technique as a fertile space for inquiry and possibly new knowledge generation. For example, Fiona Raby and Anthony Dunn speculate on the societal and cultural impacts of biotechnology, while Liam Young speculates on the environmental impacts of architectural synthetic ecologies. And this is one of the drawings that was um, produced from a workshop that I was um, in with um, Liam Young, Bruce Sterling um, and Warren Ellis and Simon Ings, where we essentially, uh, I guess, uh, talked about the developments of, um, I guess, cities for the future. But this time we imagined the city environment coming from a very muddy, uninhabitable place. 
Um, and, and essentially, you know, these, these approaches for speculative proposition are particularly useful in gauging um, with the impacts of emerging technologies, where the outcomes of these new fusions are simply not known or unknowable if it's ethically done. Also, they able, um, enable researchers to address areas that they would not otherwise get funding for because of the tight coupling between research funds and applied functions that benefit society, particularly you know, in terms of economic returns. This means that the less commercial questions that novel approaches raise, such as ethic and aesthetic uh, issues, are often not accompanied by sufficient funding for rigorous empirical testing. Additionally, centralised funding bodies often do not respond sufficiently quickly to enable these kinds of studies when they're most pertinent. But the use of fiction and speculative approaches in emergent fields of research is not purely a practical necessity in a resource-constrained world of um, you know, knowledge. It also brings unique values to our acquisition of new knowledge. For example, visualising an idea is a research method that requires critical reflection on a challenge that produces a template for further research and communication. Visualisation methods are also useful in scientific research, not just to facilitate discussion regarding the feasibility and applications of emerging technologies, but also to begin to address how prototypes may be engineered. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the protocell system that I was working with before. And that's exactly what we do, I mean, just essentially proposing some ideas and then actually trying to build them collaboratively. The philosopher Hans Weinger proposed in The Philosophy As If that in Western society we construct our reality as if it was true and then set about empirically approving our assumptions. In this sense, science already deals with a form of fiction in making a hypothesis. Whilst it's of primary importance for science to validate its fictions as a canonised truth in, in a design context, it's not necessary for a proposition to be true for it to be worthy of inquiry and reflection. And arguably, this may also be the case for science. With the 1980s publication, Hartree's field book, Science Without Numbers, which argued that mathematics does not need to be true to be good, and Bas van Frassen's The Scientific Image, which proposed that science does not seek truth, but empirical adequacy, Mark Ellie Calderon concluded that the belief in the content of, content of mathematics and science was not necessary for them to gain acceptance. He proposed this philosophical field of inquiry should be called fictionalism, which produced new knowledge through the process of inquiry itself, rather than on the validity of the final proofs. So, equipped myself with the three C's as a set of conceptual tools to navigate the vast restless seas of complex data all around me, and to find my way to getting closer to discovering the nature of complexity. My initial searches consistently pointed to endlessly branching graphics that look like strange trees, or Ernst Haeckel's radiolarians, and I wondered, was this complexity? Although the infinite branches uh, graphically signify a set of ideas about complexity as a topical, topological map or representation, they're nevertheless an abstraction that has become equated with the idea of complexity. In a recent interview on The Edge about his work on constructor theory, David Deutsch remarked that only matter can compute. Everything else that we regard as computation in mathematics and physics is only an abstraction. Similarly, my sights were not on discovering the symbolism of the phenomenon, but in discovering something more about the embodied nature of complexity. I like this one. <laughs> the origin of the study of complexity is generally attributed to biologist Ludwig von Bertalanffy's general systems theory in 1968, which proposed an organisational framework for open systems, in which, in his view, could explain some of the paradoxes between biological and physical systems. Yet these kinds of organisational ideas that are founded on the notion of a moving, restless understanding of reality 
are also expressed in other disciplines. Henri Lefebvre's rhythm analysis, Jan Christian Smut's idea of holism, Norbert Wiener's cybernetics, Ilya Prigogine's dissipative structures, the mathematics of chaos and the science of nonlinear systems. In short, these many definitions and explorations denote an intellectual field that spans disciplines and therefore engages with a variety of methods and perspectives to ascertain what is and what is not complexity. And to understand the nature of complexity requires us to think about the structure of thinking and take a philosophical diversion. The philosophical discipline that best represents the ideas that are most commonly used in complexity is process philosophy, which is concerned with the dynamic nature of being and invoke the directionality or passage of time. These ideas can be traced back to Heraclitus, the weeping or obscure philosopher who was hermetic in his habits and is always portrayed being dressed in dark clothes. Heraclitus viewed the universe as being in a state of constant flux, which was unlike the other ancient philosophers, the atomists, who viewed all the substances as being made of the same fundamental particles or atoms in different combinations. The aphorism, everything flows, nothing stands still, is attributed to Heraclitus. In, 18th, um, in the 18th century, philosopher George Hegel was inspired by Heraclitus and described reality as self-unfolding, being constructed by dynamic templates and networks. Hegel believed that reality is reason articulating itself as and within the world. He called this movement dialectics and his philosophical system was an attempt to work out the logic of the dialectical development of reality. But the most comprehensive descriptive metaphysical framework of a process-based worldview was proposed by Alfred North Whitehead in his philosophy of organism. The basic unit of reality in Whitehead's system is an event-like entity called the actual occasion which produces novelty by transferring information from the universe to repeat and reinforce certain patterns, which ultimately results in new ones. Process philosophy itself was given material re relevance by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari in their Thousand Plateaus, published in 1980, through their idea of a new materialism. They view matter as connected and agentized through heterogeneous cooperating groups of actants. That's like an, um, uh, an object that possesses its own force that could form loose reversible associations called assemblages. These are kind of modular units that are incredibly flexible. Jane Bennett's Vibrant Matter is a narrative that begins to describe the cultural and political implications of a world in which non-humans have the independent capacity to exert force and producing effects which raise questions about the ecological responsibilities of humans. Of course, Jane Bennett's project is necessarily an ecological one, and she believes that by creating a framework for thinking that enables the idea of um, an engagement with um, uh, non-humans um, as being absolutely essential for um, cultural and political change. Yet philosophy does not have the tools by which to demonstrate the validity of its ideas, but science certainly does. However, scientifically proving complexity is more challenging than it may initially seem, as its tools and methods have been designed around the atomist's view of the world, where matter is at equilibrium and where time is reversible. This Enlightenment worldview has given rise to the great paradox of the 19th century between biology and physics, where, according to Stuart Kaufman, biology appears to be capable of acting beyond natural laws without breaking them, while von Bertalanffy describes this discrepancy residing in the nature of open systems, Ilya Prigogine looks to the nature of time, which he proposed was irreversible in nonlinear systems. Indeed, the study of these parameters in scientific contexts uh, brings striking differences between what I'll roughly describe as 20th 
and 21st century science. 20th century science being based on the ideas of René Descartes, which gives us a deterministic view of the world, which here is uh, characterized in dualisms. You know, they're, they're kind of oppositions. Things are either possible or they're impossible. Um, and the central metaphor, metaphor, of course, is the machine. Whereas in 21st century science or complexity, the central metaphor is actually ecology. It's not the machine. And um, it possesses a radical creativity, Stuart Kaufman's word, which gives rise to um, events such as impossible events, co constantly unfolding, almost unpredictable, but predictable within limits, and which gives rise to a, a probabilistic view of the world. Whereas um, machines operate through hard control systems and environmentally belligerent, 21st century um, science or complexity is environmentally sensitive and embedded and deals through soft control systems. Again, this also affects the knowledge structures. 20th century science or classical science deals with specialism and reductionism um, and creates knowledge protection as the result of that. Whereas being embedded in networks, um, uh, complexity is necessarily open source as a practice and also inherently collaborative. Now, these differences between 20th and 21st century science have all kinds of consequences for the practice of scientific experiment, which need different tool sets to apprehend them. And since science is implemented through technology, our next stop is to investigate the consequences of these differences. And we'll do this at the Technology Motel. Since they originate from different conceptual frameworks, these technologies between, say, Cartesian science or classical science and complexity are rather distinct. 20th century science has enabled us to solve problems using the idea of machines. A machine is constructed by ordering inert objects in a hierarchy using a linear system. Since the objects that make up machines do not possess any agency, we need to ex apply external energy for them to perform useful work. For example, we can combust a fossil fuel to power a piston, to turn a crankshaft, to spin an axle that turns wheels, which makes a vehicle go forward. 21st century science, or complexity, uses the principles of ecology to solve problems. Now, we normally encounter this as a descriptive practice, but it can be a technology if we can direct its operations to solve challenges or to produce useful outcomes. And we can do this by changing the internal and external conditions of the system, because unlike machines, ecology is sensitive to its environment. But if you worked, walked into a hardware store or an electronic shop, you'd quickly find out that there are no ecological technologies in commercial circulation. In some ways, that makes them a science fiction proposition. However, they do exist in the real world as an emerging technological platform. And they're being developed in research centers around the world. And I describe them as being like the operating systems for what will become you know, complex and ecological technologies. And these systems can be broadly described as different kinds of natural computing, a term inspired by Alan Turing's interest in the computational power of nature. So, for example, Martin Hanzuk is wor working with smart droplets or soft robots at the University of Southern Denmark. Andy Adamatsky is using slime mold and unconventional computing techniques at the University of West England. And Lee Cronin is building inorganic chemical cells at the University of Glasgow. Now, all of these systems have hardware and software that is based in general chemistry. And so I'm going to illustrate um, how we actually might imagine a complex technology or an ecological te technology work in a way that the platform can be described differently to how we might imagine a machine. And so for, for starters, you can actually see that um, a complex technology by nature is actually self-assembled rather than manufactured. Um, and ecological technologies or complex technologies, they're not made of objects. As I mentioned before, they exist as interactions between agents. And these agents actually can exert a, a force in their own right. Humans do not apply this force. Even though they can reach equilibrium, the, the force is internally generated through the hardware and software of these technologies, which is based in general chemistry. And 
these forces can become quite complex and exert complex effects. So in this particular system, it's a Buchli system, which was designed by Otto Buchli, first described in 1898. Um, and it's just literally adding uh, alkali to um, olive oil, effectively making soap. Um, but what it does is that um, it actually has this striking lifelike behavior. These droplets can move around their environment, they can sense it, they can interact with each other, and they can start to produce a soap-like product as part of their metabolism. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, these, these have provided me with a model system in which I can reflect how we might start to describe complexity in a technological context, not just as a descriptive ecological practice, but how do we actually operationalize it? So first of all, it, this is not a system that is in a, in a linear order. It's working in parallel. Um, it is also not hierarchical. Um, also, that these groups are loose and reversible interactions. And I'll, I'll show you another short video in, in a minute. But essentially, we can think of this as being the unit of the technological platform, which um, can be described as an assemblage. That's a word that's been used by Deleuze and Guattari. It comes from you know, this, uh, uh, I guess, actor network theory, Bruno Latour's ideas. But essentially, an assemblage is this, is this flexible, collaborative um, uh, unit that um, I guess you can think of it in some ways as modular, um, but it's actually more connecting than a, than a module because it consists of heterogeneous um, agents. And it demonstrates a flexibility and resilience and robustness and environmental sensitivity that is not present in machines. Not only this, um, that I think what's quite interesting is that these um, interactions exist within a spectrum of possibility, so they are predictive. You can predict them, but within limits. Um, and uh, this is a this is a, a, a different scale. So that was um, uh, Buchli droplets at about times ten. This is um, Buchli droplets as ab about time uh, uh, scale uh, times four. Um, what I'm going to show you here is that so we're looking at a Buchli system, again, you know, that the interactions of assemblages are generally conservative, um, except, and we know this about ecological systems, except when they reach tipping points. And what you're seeing here is um, uh, droplets that have all been made at room temperature, all under the same conditions. They existed as two um, uh, separate populations. And then when they, when they kind of mix together, um, they undergo a change in their behavior and their appearance, um, which I'm uh, describing as a, a tipping point. Um, and so although these systems actually have a, you know, a certain amount of predictability, say like, for example, making a cake, you know that putting eggs and sugar and flour and butter into a bowl, whipping it up, putting it into the oven at a particular temperature is going to give you a range of things that from a nasty black biscuit, my end of the range is cooking, to a beautiful gateau that my grandmother makes, and somewhere in between will be that kind of um, outcome. This is exactly the kind of, there's a probabilistic outcome to, to the technologies associated with um, uh, uh, complexity. So I, I mentioned that the way that these become technologized is, you know, that was just really a description of a, of a hardware, you know, the, trying to articulate the hardware of a complex technology by not referring to the same language that we use when we refer to machines, particularly the word efficiency. Um, and um, the way that we can direct them is by changing internal and external conditions. Well, in this um, particular droplet, I've changed the internal conditions by introducing a mineral, which means that the dissolved um, uh, when it comes in contact with dissolved carbon dioxide, it will produce um, a carbonate precipitate. Um, and we can also change the external conditions. And in this case, I've just added alcohol to the medium to which you can see that the droplets have completely stampeded. Um, and then they become rather quiet, slow down, and become very still after a while. Um, and so essentially, you know, creating you know, context in which you can manipulate these systems then um, enables us to start to operationalize it. Now, we can also change the size of the, um, of the droplets. And I did this in an architectural context um, for the Hylozoic Ground exhibition, which was shown at the Venice Biennale in, um, at Venice Architecture Biennale in 2010. Um, and here we have a cybernetic system in which, I'm not sure whether we can see any, uh, oh, that's a little hygroscopic um, B 
feed, um, have little glass vials of, um, of, of droplets. Oh, they, they look like those droplets before. But essentially what happens is that um, little vials of droplets in this environment now become agents that are entangled with other agents. So I said that you know, an assemblage could be thought of a, a heterogeneous platform in where unlike agents, providing that they have some kind of affinity, loose reversible affinity with each other, can actually start to cooperate and interact. And in this particular system, the um, uh, cybernetic framework was actually interacting with people with embodied sensors that, um, uh, so there were position sensors, um, uh, you know, proximity sensors, um, and um, uh, light um, sensors, so that the the environment was kind of shaking and and, and dynamic through these through these uh, volleys that were sent through the the neural network, um, and essentially this moved the um, visitors through the gallery and the. Um, droplets then sense the um, uh, changes in carbon dioxide levels very, very, very slowly, very, very, very poetically. And essentially, you know, uh, poetically we could think of this as being almost like an artificial smell or taste receptor that was responding to the presence or smelling and tasting people that were present in the environment um, by um, changing their colour in the presence of carbon dioxide. So. I mean, how do we apply these principles to everyday situation? And uh, to reflect on this, let's go to the cultural motel. For these emerging technologies to have cultural relevance, they need to exist at a scale <coughs> by which they can be observed, manipulated and inhabited. Ecological technologies make sense when the Earth really is considered as a giant natural supercomputer although it remains debatable whether the supercomputer has been commissioned and paid for by a race of hyper-intelligent, pan-dimensional beings, or whether Earth's supercomputer can indeed calculate the answer to life, the universe and everything as instructed by deep thought. But just for a moment, let's pretend that we're starting to understand a little about how supercomputer Earth works. How then could we begin to meaningfully use our new ecological technologies? And this is a um, still from a project that um, I, I will always be in the process of working on. I think that is the nature of these uh, emergent technologies. Um, this is a project called Future Venice, which proposes to sustainably reclaim the city of Venice by growing an artificial limestone reef underneath it. Um, using a giant natural computer, um, which is composed of droplets very much like the ones we've just seen. And the idea is that these droplets are engineered to move away from the light, which we can do in the laboratory, and also when they're at rest to actually be able to uh, um, use minerals and dissolve carbon dioxide to create a deposit, um, a kind of biocrete or a limestone, um, which then um, can be uh, introduced into the light-soaked canals in the uh, city, where they move underneath the darkened foundations, which stand on wood piles. So Venice is standing on stilettos in the mud. And the idea is that these droplets then create an accretion technology underneath the city, and that puts platform boots on the city. Um, and what's interesting about it is that this process already exists within the waterway. So these are, these are accretions created by bacteria and algae and shellfish. Um, and this is actually a photograph taken around the waterways of Venice. Um, the other thing that's, so the idea then is that you know, the, an ecological technology or a complex technology, one that is sensitive to its environment, um, may be able to work in concert with the non-human world to co-construct an architecture, for example, that has meaning both to wildlife as well as city inhabitants. Um, interestingly, um, the idea that the natural computer could respond to environmental change um, is quite a realistic one. So, for example, say Venice dries out rather than drowns after the raising of the Moses Gates, or if uh, Pietro Tiatini et al. have their way and they reinflate Venice's aquifers and raise the city by a foot over the course of 10 years. What will happen is that the wood piles will be exposed. However, if the natural computer was in place, then essentially the accretion technology moving with the downward force of the water would uh, create a, a sealant, a biocrete sealant around the wood piles, and therefore stop them rotting on exposure to the air. Speculative, but it's these kinds of experiments become um, interesting when we think about what the kinds of application of these emerging technologies might be. 
So the final um, project I'd like to uh, share with you is uh, Project Persephone. So this is part of the Icarus Interstellar Group's work with the DARPA-funded 100-year Starship um, Initiative. And this aims to catalyze the construction of a crewed interstellar ship within 100 years. Persephone is about the construction and design of a living interior to the spaceship, um, which would support the interstellar crew and effectively constitutes a, a kind of space nature. Um, right now, what we're dealing with is talking about how we might design across generations rather than three to five year product cycles, which is you know, currently our driver for any kind of change. Um, and the other thing we're thinking about is what, do we, what infrastructures do we need in place in order to deal with evolvable systems? I mean, these aren't just speculative ideas. They are actually also um, being turned into models and prototypes um, that deal with real world effects, like how do we deal with um, resource shortages in our mega cities? And we're working with um, architects like A Studio to help us start to uh, embody some of the ideas, for example, like um, algae facades. Um, in producing fuel and food um, and a, uh, a means for um, cleaning water. So although these might seem like science fiction right now, we are gaining a new 21st century technological portfolio based on complexity, which we can add to our established 20th century mechanical solutions. And we're going to need both of these if we are to address the significant challenges that we're facing with swelling populations and our unstable Earth. But before we can realize the full potential of our emerging technologies, we actually need audacious visions. We do. We need to actually try to think differently. I mean, really differently. Not the kind of incremental thinking that we're, refer that we're actually rewarded for. Um, and, and these kinds of spaces um, you know, can help us ignite our you know, imagination, our creativity, and our optimism. That's really important. Um, uh, so that we can make full use of the technological portfolios that we have and the ones that we're developing. Um, and I, I think this is really important when we're dealing with the 21st century, which is mired in uncertainty. You know, and this isn't something that we can rationally predict. We're trying to figure out what's going to happen this century with climate change. Um, there are so many variables. It is as much as a work of fiction as what I've been telling you right now. Um, and, but, I, I, but I think it's important that we engage, and that's the point. The, the, the point is engagement. The point is actually putting your ideas out there. And I think that you know, complexity with its, with, its, with its philosophy, and I, and I think Ilya Prigogine was actually really neat when he, when he pointed out that the trade-off for uncertainty is that actually we're empowered, that we can actually get engaged and make a difference in a system by creating contingencies. You know, and, and that's what we can do. We can actually have a creative practice that empowers us to deal with the unknown. I think it's even more important when we have a fundamental, well, pr pretty much secular society as well. So, you know, so that we can actually start to build visions that, um, that unite us through a diverse set of practices and ideas. Some of these will be realized and become mainstream technologies. Some of them will you know, wither and die like the plant pots I keep. Um, anyway, there's the answer. And um, what I've discovered about thumbing my way around the knowledge uh, galaxy in the search of meaning for complexity and, 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 and what it actually is, is that our species is still in search of the question, which could give answer to the meaning of complexity. And when we find the right question, then the Earth, maybe designed by a deep thought, could actually be able to calculate it. Perhaps it will take five million years, as it says right here in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Or maybe it will take 10 million years, as predicted by E.O. Wilson and his colleagues. But maybe, just maybe, by harnessing the supercomputer Earth and our audacious creativity to the swerve of the Klinemann, we may just be able to make a planetary scale leap in our collective imaginations and avoid the sixth great extinction, or whatever they're calling the hyperspace bypasses nowadays. There's no point in acting surprised about it. All the planning charts and demolitions orders 
have been on display at your local planning department at Alpha Centauri for 50 of your Earth years, so you've had plenty of time to lodge any formal complaint, and it's far too late to start making a fuss about it now. The rest of you, keep banging the rocks together. That's it. <laughs>